Hello, and welcome to Decision Points, the story of key moments in the history of the U.S.-Israel relationship. My name is David Makovsky, the Ziegler Distinguished Fellow at the Washington Institute and Director of the Project on Arab-Israel Relations, and I'm excited to go on this journey through history with you. On today's episode, we will be discussing the growing threat of a nuclear Iran and efforts to contain these ambitions. Before the 1979 Islamic Revolution, Israel was quietly allied with Iran's leader, the Shah. After the fall of the Shah and the rise of Ayatollah Khomeini, these relations disintegrated. Iran's new leader sought to assert leadership in the Muslim world by outbidding the Sunni Arabs when it came to militancy and no compromises with Israel. In the 1990s, Israeli leader Yitzhak Rabin predicted that Iran had cast its aspirations on creating a nuclear weapon. In 2005, Iranian hardliner Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, a Holocaust denier who explicitly called for Israel to be wiped off the map, was elected president of Iran. Even before then, information became public that the Iranians were beginning to enrich nuclear-grade uranium at a facility in northern Iran. This caused the imposition of sanctions by the U.N., the European Union, and the U.S. under the Bush administration with bipartisan support. Between its regional proxies and its nuclear ambitions, Israel now considered Iran an existential threat. Israel began preparing covert and overt military plans to prevent and combat a nuclear Iran. Certain leaders, including Benjamin Netanyahu, advocated for either American action or U.S. support for Israeli action. However, both presidents George W. Bush and Barack Obama were reluctant to support American or Israeli military strikes. Amid disagreement over the strike, the U.S. and Israel worked together to constrain Iran. And apparently this included several cyber attacks against Iran's nuclear facilities. In April 2008, the Fordow nuclear facility was discovered inside a mountain near the Iranian religious city of Qom. This facility was too small to produce civilian nuclear energy. Officials from the Obama administration and the Netanyahu government began to meet more frequently on the issue. At the same time, both Democrats and Republicans in Congress, supported by the Obama administration, tightened economic sanctions on Iran. Obama's hope was that economic sanctions would constrain Iran's nuclear program. The U.S. also worried that an Israeli strike on Iran could ignite a regional war. To avert that possibility, in late 2012 and early 2013, the White House decided on a back channel, communicating through the Omani Sultan. The U.S. officials told Iranian Supreme Leader Ayatollah Khamenei that the U.S. was open to diplomatic talks but would not hesitate to strike Iran if it rejected diplomacy. The administration kept talks secret from Israel, fearing Netanyahu or his allies would leak. The secrecy was and remains a debated issue among Obama-era officials. The Israelis, however, found out about the talk, souring the relationship between the two countries and between Obama and Netanyahu. The idea of an Israeli strike against Iran seemed to reach a pitch during 2012. Netanyahu felt the Obama administration's diplomatic approach had value, but it was insufficient. In short, he did not just want the restrictions on Iran's nuclear program to last approximately a dozen years. He wanted a much longer timeline. Netanyahu delivered a speech in March 2015 to a joint session of Congress denouncing the negotiations with Iran and circumventing Obama. My friends, I've come here today because as Prime Minister of Israel, I feel a profound obligation to speak to you about an issue that could well threaten the survival of my country and the future of my people, Iran's quest for nuclear weapons. This infuriated the administration, and ties did not recover. Still, on July 14, 2015, the U.S. announced the completed negotiation called the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, known by its acronym, the JCPOA, or known simply as the Iran nuclear deal. Today, after two years of negotiations, the United States, together with our international partners, has achieved something that decades of animosity has not, a comprehensive long-term deal with Iran that will prevent it from obtaining a nuclear weapon. During the Trump administration, the U.S. pulled out of the JCPOA and tightened sanctions. 
In response, in 2019, Iran hit a series of targets belonging to U.S. Arab allies in the Persian Gulf. President Trump said he wants to meet Iranian President Hassan Rouhani, leaving Arabs and Israelis alike to wonder if the U.S. approach is about to shift again. To discuss key moments in U.S. policy towards Iran is Howard Berman. Howard Berman was a member of the U.S. Congress between 1983 and 2013. He was the chair of the House Foreign Affairs Committee and served on the Judiciary Committee. Congressman Berman is considered a leading foreign policy figure in the Congress at the time and particularly active on the Iran issue. Howard, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, David. So tell us about the view from Congress during your time in office, and to what extent would you say even the legacy of the Iraq War influenced lawmakers thinking on Iran? 30 years in Congress was a long time, and views about Iran evolved uh, dramatically. Obviously, when I first came to Congress, this was soon after the uh, hostage taken, the uh, revolution, and the regime. But Iran was not in the forefront of everyone's attention at, at that particular point. For me, and perhaps well before Congress focused on Iran, was the reports coming in the late mid and late 90s, in some cases from Israeli sources, but often confirmed by the United States, that Russia in particular and other countries were assisting Iran in gaining the expertise to move towards a nuclear capability through uh, and training of their engineers at technological institutes, through the passage of different kinds of technologies from Pakistan and other countries like that. And that became a big issue for me. And a number of other people focused on it. And we passed our first extraterritorial sanctions at that time, then known as the Iran-Libya Sanctions Act, ILSA which imposed sanctions on countries who invested in the Iranian energy uh, program, expanding their capability to pursue the costly nuclear uh, effort that they seem to be starting to undertake. What we took from that, though, was that unilateral imposition of extraterritorial sanctions seemed to have no impact because no administration and in this case, both the Clinton administration and the Bush administration would ever impose sanctions on Europe companies in Europe or on other allies of ours. But as we got closer to 2005, 2006, uh, more developments, more activities by Iran, uh, there became a general awareness of this. And we concluded that we ought to try this again. One big change that occurred uh, was in the last few years of the Bush administration, they started developing, sometimes in the context of money laundering or in drug deals or in the activities by businesses with Iranian companies, the use of extraditorial financial sanctions that seemed to be having a real impact. And in fact, at the time, the United Arab Emirates was a place, and Dubai in particular, was a middleman between Iran and other countries and other companies doing business in ways that we would not have wanted to happen. And as those sanctions started to going in place, that relationship changed dramatically. And and much of, the, of these middlemen were seriously impeded in being able to continue their practice. So we decided to make as a priority in 2009 the imposition of new tough sanctions to uh, try and deter Iran uh, from uh, pursuing a nuclear weapon capability. Can you give us a sense of, of what these sanctions were that were robust, that, you know, that were different than the past? One, at the same time as we were doing this, and really for the first time seriously, the Europeans – our close allies, Japan, South Korea, and even Russia and China were getting concerned about what was happening in Iran, all for different reasons. And so we finally had an international group of countries with real clout that were thinking about going down the same road. So that strengthened our efforts. Secondly, the utilization of these financial sanctions on companies and on financial institutions 
all of whom wanted to do business with the United States, became very effective in curtailing Iran's ability to get new investment, to engage in new uh, – in certain kinds of trade, and then the effort to – diplomatically and then later on by sanctions to cut their ability to sell their oil. There's no doubt that people like yourselves and others were very alarmed about Iran's actions and, uh, you know, were focused on doing the sanctions for its own sake. To what extent do you think for some others there was a sense, well, let's get behind a bipartisan effort because it is an alternative also to an Israeli strike? To what extent did the threat of a strike, was it a spur to congressional action? When the House passed Sasada, which was the, the name of the legislation that we introduced in 2009 and passed in 2010, there was a very, very broad base of support, including from some very liberal Democrats who on the natural would have been very anti military action. And I think part of the reason was the international – building international support for this legislation. But I don't think the primary purpose was we're doing this in order to take the next step of military action. I think the more general belief – I exclude some people who had been arguing for a military action for a number of years from this group, but the majority of the Congress – wanted the pressure of the economic sanctions to cause Iran to decide that the way they were going was going to cause more pain than they could uh, tolerate and they would have to change their status and their position. So the sanctions would hopefully, if it worked, would avert military action. It wasn't a precursor to that action. My guess is some were skeptical, but I've been hearing reports about both internal dissension within Iran leading to regime change for 25 years or longer, and it never quite seems to happen. So I think, by and large, the majority feeling at the time was we have to use the economic tools to persuade them that they had to change their position rather than overturn the regime. Two more questions. One is we talk about bipartisanship, and it seems that there's been a fracturing of the U.S.-Israel relationship, and part of it is you know, might be connected to the Iran nuclear deal. Are you optimistic that that bipartisanship can be healed going forward? Well, uh, we have that fracture. There's no doubt about it. It concerns me greatly. Uh, we also have an incredible polarization on almost every other issue in the United States these days. It's hard for me to think that this administration helps I'm sure there's fault on all sides, but this administration creates an environment where that's the most likely outcome. But I think uh, as time passes, we can restore that. And I think there are a lot of people in Congress who would like to, but particularly for the members of the Republican Party with this administration, it's very tough to because they don't know when uh, they'll get hit by the president and his strong base of support. My final question is, again, I, I realize you're not in Congress now, but given the perspective that you've accumulated over the decades and you follow this issue closely, do you think that the Iran nuclear deal will be amended? Do you have hopes or do you think this deal is irrevocably broken and you can't put Humpty Dumpty back together again? No. I, look, on both sides at the time JCPOA was agreed to, there were two counter narratives, each of one flawed. The one from the administration at the time, this stops Iran from having a nuclear weapons program. It didn't – it delayed it. It deferred it. That was valuable, but it did not stop it. The other one, this paves the way to Iran getting a nuclear weapon program was not true either. And the notion that many of us who were opposed to leaving the JCPOA when we did were concerned about turns out not to be so. We were concerned that the U.S. extraterritorial sanctions will have no impact if the Europeans, the Russians, and the Chinese are still in this. And what we learn since that time, and this is where I myself realize I was wrong, is the power of those extraterritorial financial sanctions in keeping companies from doing business with Iran. So Iran is hurting economically as a result of what's happening. What I understand you're saying is – 
that the power of the U.S. Treasury is such that, you know, some might say, look, if the U.S. pulls out, you know, we're not a big trading partner with Iran, so we don't really matter to the Iranians. But to the European countries, if they're faced with the alternatives, do business with the U.S. or do business with Iran, it's a no-brainer for those Europeans because they do so much more business with the U.S. And therefore, the U.S. leverage is disproportionately strong, even if its bilateral trading relationship with Iran is weak. Absolutely right. And that's true, even though some of the European governments want them to keep trading because they didn't break out of JCPOA. So they're more concerned about ability to do business with American companies and American banks and the centrality of the American financial system to world economic uh, trade and investment that they will defy the wishes of their own governments in order to keep those relationships with American companies. So the final thing is because American leverage is way greater than our actual trading relationship with Iran itself, could you be optimistic of a grand bargain? Yes. Of saying, put in the mix, not just nuclear, but support for your proxy groups like Hezbollah and the Islamic Jihad. But wouldn't we have a more stable Middle East if we could reach a wider set of understandings, not just on the nuclear issue, but on a range of issues. I very much agree, but I think there are some prerequisites to it. You can't be bad-mouthing our European allies for everything they're doing, getting into a very difficult diplomatic situation with South Korea, taking some of these key allies. We want to get back into lockstep with them on changing JCPOA to make it more effective and hopefully certainly to try and expand it to include uh, the missile issues. But you're going to have to give up on regime change as a goal. Howard Berman, longtime leading member of the U.S. Congress, someone who has a clarion voice on these issues. We thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you. A few weeks later, after interviewing Howard Berman, former chairman of the House Foreign Affairs Committee, I've been fortunate to speak to General David Petraeus to get his perspective on Iran's role in the U.S.-Israel relationship. General David Petraeus is a longstanding, distinguished career as a public servant, including being the director of the CIA 2011-2012. Prior to that role, he served 37 years in the U.S. Army including as a commander of U.S. forces in Afghanistan and NATO International Security Assistance Force. He has a Ph.D. at Princeton University, I should add. He's currently the chairman of the KKR Global Institute, and it's truly an honor to have General David Petraeus as my guest. I should say the interview is being done with General Petraeus is in New York, and I'm on a research trip in the Middle East. So with me in the Middle East and General Petraeus in the Northeast, General Petraeus, thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure, David. Thank you. Maybe to go back over time, Iran has been in the news lately because of the death of Soleimani. But how do you see Iran's action regarding its regional proxies and its nuclear ambitions? How has it evolved over time? In considerable part, actually, thanks to Qasem Soleimani, who was, of course, the, as you mentioned, the leader of the Quds Force of the Islamic Revolutionary Guards Corps of Iran for 22 years. And I've described him from time to time as a combination in U.S. terms of director of the CIA, commander of Joint Special Operations Command, and regional envoy for uh, Iran for that region. And he's had a huge role in the establishment of the proxy forces, these Quds Force supported, trained, equipped, and often directed militias as he has developed the plan and then overseen its execution to solidify the Shia Crescent, of course, extending from Iran through Iraq, Syria, and down into southern Lebanon to Hezbollah. And to try to Lebanonize as many of these countries as is possible. Yeah. So by Lebanonization, what I mean is Iran's efforts to do in Iraq and Syria, perhaps elsewhere, what they have accomplished in Lebanon, which is to achieve considerable strength on the streets through powerful militias, obviously Lebanese Hezbollah in the case of Lebanon, 
and then also to achieve very considerable strength in the parliament. Again, in the case of Lebanon, Hezbollah and its coalition have a virtual veto authority there. And Iran would love to achieve the same in Iraq, where it is supporting a number of different militia groups, Shia militia, that were defeated, most of them, of course, during the surge in Iraq in March and April of 2008 in the battles of Basra and Sadr City and Qadami and so forth, but then had reason to get back on the streets in uniform with weapons when the Islamic State was threatening the very outskirts of Baghdad, and they've been on the streets ever since. And then, of course, they've sought to have a similar amount of power in the Council of Representatives, the Iraqi parliament. And we saw that manifest itself quite recently in the passage of legislation to require the prime minister to develop a plan to ask the international forces to leave. So Qasem Soleimani has been the mastermind of a great deal of this. Certainly, there are lots of other activities in Iran that are of enormous concern, needless to say, the nuclear program, and that is back front and center now that Iran is no longer going to observe the nuclear deal that was established during the previous U.S. administration, and of course, the missile program. And we have seen developments in that program uh, that were quite considerable and concerning in the attack on the Abqaiq oil facility in Saudi Arabia, which is some 5% of the global oil production, about 5 million barrels a day, where very precisely and with enormous understanding of how that facility operated, specific capabilities were targeted and hit very, very accurately, uh, knocking out, again, that amount of capacity for a month or so. So all of these activities have been ongoing. Again, Qasem Soleimani was behind a number of those, particularly those, again, in, in neighboring countries, in line with what he sent me as a message through the Iraqi president. Yeah, tell that story. That's a story that not a lot of our listeners know about that I think is a very vivid moment in uh, kind of U.S.-Iranian relations. Well, it was a bit of a wake-up call as to who really had the power in Iran over some key policies. The message that came to me via the president of Iraq, who had just met with Qasem Soleimani just inside Iran, was, General Petraeus, you should know that I, Qasem Soleimani, control the policy for Iran when it comes to Iraq and also Syria, Lebanon, Gaza, and Afghanistan, and now you would add Yemen as well. The point of his message was, quit fooling around with those diplomats if you want to deal with somebody in Iran, you should deal with me. Needless to say, we were not going to do that. When the president of Iraq asked me for my reply, I told him essentially to tell Qasem Soleimani to pound sand. When was this, by the way, just for just to put it in context? Late March 2008, during the initial stages of the Battle of Basra. Can you just say about the nuclear ambitions? How do you trace those origins? And, you know, who were the key players as you see it in Iran? What has driven them to have these ambitions? Well, I think the ambitions stem from a recognition that if you can gain a nuclear weapon, you have considerable leverage when it comes to relations with, say, the United States and other countries around the world. The best example of that is North Korea where we have a real conundrum about what to do about and how to restrain further development of delivery capabilities and nuclear weapons. Whereas you contrast that with Libya, of course, which gave up its weapons of mass destruction, even Ukraine, which gave them up. When you don't have that capability, obviously there's a degree of vulnerability that is not present if you indeed have nuclear weapons. So that, I think, is the origin. Again, it's hard to speak for the Iranians. And it is true to say that, as many do, that the Iranians never made the final decision, if you will, to actually develop a nuclear weapon. But that was somewhat immaterial, in my view, because they were taking actions that would in, were, in effect, what you would take if there had been a decision to pursue the development of a nuclear weapon and delivery means. They just had never gotten to the stage where they needed the final decision to go from 
say, 20% rich uranium to weapons grade and the final testing of the delivery means and the reentry and all the rest of this, which is quite technical and no guarantee that that capability truly existed. But they were approaching, you know, I think it was publicly known that, for example, the Secretary of State and others at the time have stated that the amount of time it would take for Iran to develop a nuclear weapon and delivery system was certainly well less than a year. And in some cases, they were arguing that it was approaching well under six months. It did indicate how that threat had been dramatically reduced in terms of time and did absolutely concentrate the mind at that time in the determination of those in the previous administration that were seeking a nuclear deal that would not only halt that progress, but would roll it back quite considerably so that at a minimum, it would have been a year or more. It was not perfect. We can talk about that later, perhaps, or some legitimate shortcomings identified by individuals, again, depending on your assumption of how Iran would operate when some of the different provisions hit their sunset clause and whether they truly operate under the non-proliferation treaties additional protocol with integrity or not. So this podcast is focused a lot on the U.S.-Israel relationship. And, you know, as we explore in this episode, the the Iranian challenge, and it's hard to telescope such a lot in a few words, but clearly the U.S. and Israel have seen eye to eye on the kind of the regional aspirations of Iran to try to destabilize countries to have kind of malevolent influence in many respects. But on the nuclear issue, if you had to telescope going back to the early 2000s, where have these two countries, how us, the United States and Israel, where have we been in sync and where have we not been in sync in broad strokes? Well, first of all, in very broad strokes, there has been almost near total alignment between the activities of the U.S. and Israel. There are certainly some cases that I recall, without getting into details, where Israel may have taken actions that they didn't share with us or wouldn't confirm or deny having taken. I'm sure there are some cases where there were some activities that we were undertaking that perhaps we might not have shared, although I'm a little hard-pressed to think of those. But 99% of the time, we were engaged in activities together, whether it was to disrupt and delay Iran's nuclear program through a variety of different initiatives and a truly comprehensive effort. Now, certainly, there were probably more misgivings about that deal in Israel than perhaps in the administration in the U.S. at the time. But the fact is that the Israeli chief of general staff assessed that aid is more secure for 10 years. Now, of course, that is a key period because that identifies one of the issues with that agreement, and that is that it has certain sunset clauses, and that depending on your assumptions about how Iran would adhere to the non-proliferation treaty gives you more or less confidence about what would happen when those sunset clauses are breached. In my view, I think this should be the, among the issues that one would want to sit down and discuss with Iran. And I'm hopeful, frankly, there will be some diplomatic initiative now that it appears in the wake of the retaliation by Iran against the United States in the wake of Soleimani's killing, that it appears that both sides seek some degree of de-escalation. Right. Are you hopeful that some of these U.S.-Israel differences could be addressed and maybe even the, the JCPOA, the nuclear deal in that sense, if there's a 2.0 version in the coming years, it could be tweaked to everyone's satisfaction? I'm not one actually who would have counseled leaving an international agreement, given that it had not been violated in any significant way by Iran. There are issues with it that cause concern, such as the amount of money that was allowed to go back to Iran, noting that there were obligations for a pretty considerable amount of that money, re-entry to the international financial world and world trade provided additional assets, that some of which could be softened off to be used by none other than, of course, the Revolutionary Guards Corps Quds Force and other malign activities, as the term is used, again, typically referring to the support for militias 
uh, they're carrying out the actions that we described earlier, and also for further development of the, again, the missile program, which is of such concern, and, and some other military capabilities as well. But so, yeah, I'd like look, look to see that uh, happen. I think you actually cannot deny some of the beneficial elements of this agreement. The major components of that program were not just halted, but rolled back quite considerably. And if you could achieve a more for more, the President Macron proposal that you described, or some other formula to extend the duration of the agreement, perhaps again to also encompass the so-called malign activities and missile program, then I think we would be in a much better place. And frankly, the Iranian citizens would be in a much, much better place. My last question is, we talked about the regional dimension to this, and Israel has done this, what it's called the campaign between the wars, which is to avoid binary situation, believing that it cannot have peace with Iran, but doesn't want war with Iran. So I'm just wondering how you evaluate this kind of shadow war that is going on uh, between Israel and Iran and Syria. Are there lessons here to be learned? I think so. Obviously, there is a lot of learning, a lot of sharing, I am sure, that's going on. Not a topic I've actually asked my old colleagues about, but one has to think that if our airframes are being flown in that airspace, which also, of course, does have some Russian advanced air defense systems in them, that we are all sharing lessons that are being learned from those particular endeavors. So, again, I think this is quite a masterful campaign. I think it has significantly reduced or disrupted Iran's ability to act in Syria to support the militias that directly threaten Israel and to, again, prevent the establishment of the kind of ground line of communication that Iran has sought for a very considerable period of time. And a lot of what Israel has done against other elements actually, I think, is applicable in various ways to what the U.S. seeks to do, sometimes against the same enemies, sometimes against others. Well, I cannot thank you enough for your time and your insights that you were able really to shed light on an issue that has a whole history but is very timely today. And I want to thank you very much for your service to our country We all know freedom isn't free, and we're grateful, General Petraeus, for your contribution, both in the military and in civilian life, and I want to thank you very much for joining us. This has been a fascinating interview with General David Petraeus. I think the vivid story of the interaction with Qasem Soleimani is jaw-dropping. I think just hearing that in General Petraeus' voice about that intersection and why he saw Soleimani as a figure that's hard to replace it was, was, to me, uh, illuminating. On the issue of the Iran nuclear deal, I heard in General Petraeus that he sees Iran as a clearly malevolent player in the Middle East, and he's wondering if the parties step back from the brink and are able to use this as a way to segue to a negotiation that would be more to satisfactory, maybe even to both sides. Thank you all very much for listening. I would urge you also to look at the book that Dennis Ross and I wrote called Be Strong and of Good Courage, How Israel's Most Important Leaders Shaped Its Destiny. A lot of declassified material coming both from State Department archives and the archives of Israel. Please go to your favorite podcast app, subscribe, rate, and review, and tell your friends. I want to thank all of those who made this podcast possible. Basha Rosenbaum, Richard Myron, and Anouk Millet of Earshot Strategies. Paul Woody Woodhull of District Productive on Capitol Hill. Scott Boxer, Rena Wasserstein, and David Patkins.